All right, we're winding up 1 Thessalonians this morning, and uh, we will obviously be in chapter 5. That's the only chapter we've looked at 1 and 2 together, 3 and 4 together, and chapter 5 we're looking at independently. Um, next week, we just can roll right on into 2 Thessalonians, and we'll give some introductory information, which we'll covers chapters uh, 1 and 2 in our study uh, next time. And then from there, we go to Timothy. So let's review where we've been in chapters 1 to 4. What was chapter 1 about? All right. Everything in the book touches somehow uh, on the second coming because every chapter ends on that note. We'll see that even in this study. So chapter 1 dealt with that, but he, his main emphasis was the impact and the effect that the gospel had at Thessalonica. What kind of impact did it have? Had a good impact. So much so that how large was the church? Not in numbers, but was it a large church, small church? How do we know? The text calls it in Acts that there was a multitude, which suggests it was a very large church. And so this wasn't just a small little group that it was converted. So it had a major impact in that a large number were converted. Uh, converted from what? Chapter 1. Idolatry. Yes, they would turn from idols to serve the living God. Chapter 2. All right, Paul's conduct and their reception. In other words, here's how I conducted myself while in your midst, and then here's how you received the message. How did they receive the message? Verse 13. All right, not as the word of men, but as the word of God, for what it really was. Chapter 3 now. This was last time. Very good. Paul's concern for their faith. Why was he concerned? We're concerned about everybody, but he was concerned about Thessalonica because of a specific circumstance. What was that? Persecution. He had left them in this cloud of persecution, and he left to take the pressure off of them. And so that maybe his presence would relieve some of the pressure. And he was concerned how they fared after he left. How well did they do after I left? Did they cave? Did they fall uh, to the pressure? Or did they stand up to the pressure? And when he got a report back from Timothy, what was the report? Good. Things went well. They've stood up strong. They, they're holding up well. And they have uh, been firm. Chapter 4. What's chapter 4 all about? Say again? Yeah, there's, there's uh, toward the end of the chapter, there's some exhortation concerning the dead, some clarification concerning the dead, and the comfort that he gives, and then there's some practical exhortation in the first part. So here's some practical things, and then here is the concern for the dead. Now here's our outline of the book that we've been considering. Paul's work among the Thessalonians chapters 1 to 3. And then four and five deal with right living in view of the second coming. So everything relates to the second coming as we've talked about. And so we're ready for chapter five, watching for the day of the Lord, watching for that second coming, watching when this will take place. We've been given key verses, so let's give one for chapter five. I think it would have to be verse four. But you, brethren, are not of the darkness, so that the day should overtake you as a thief. That is, those who are the people of God are children of the day. They walk in the light. And so there is no reason why those who have been instructed and those who have been taught and those who know how to live should be caught off guard concerning the second coming. Make sense? Verse 4, key verse, I think, for this chapter. All right, let's go to question number 1 for today. And what's the theme or the message of chapter 5? All right, Christians ought to be watchful in all things. Anything else? Very good. All right, talks about the day of the Lord, which is the second coming, the end of time. I call it simply the day of the Lord and then duties in various relationships. And those duties are based upon the fact the day of the Lord is coming and in view of the second coming. So here's how we live, here's how we conduct ourselves some practical exhortation in view of that second coming. And remember the second coming is dealt with in every chapter. Uh, 
Let's get a summary, then we'll go back to our questions. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, talks about the coming of the Lord. What do we know about the coming of the Lord? We'll have a question about that here in a moment. Then 12 to 22 deals with duties in various relationships. Our responsibility to God, our responsibility to other Christians, our responsibility to elders, they're dealt with here. Uh, weak members, uh, strong, uh, 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 discouraged members, uh, disorderly members, all of that's dealt with in that context. And then he ends with some salutations. So let's go back to our questions now. Question number two, what two things does Paul compare the second coming? Or two what? Two things does Paul compare the second coming? A thief in the night and labor pains. We'll talk about those here in a second. Let's get question three. What do you learn from verses 1 through 11 about the second coming or the coming of Christ? It is coming. It's a fact. All right, that's one thing. What else? All right, we don't know when. It's unexpected. What else? Say again. Can't escape. Sudden. What else? Say again. Yes. Children who are children of light, in other words, faithful Christians, are going to be watchful. We're going to be careful and watchful. And all of that we learn from verses 1 through 11. Question four, list the characteristics of the kind of life one should live, including the things we should and should not do in view of the coming of Christ found in verses 1 through 11. What do you see there? We ought to be vigilant. Say again. Encouraged. We ought to encourage one another. That's true. Yeah, be careful who you listen to. What about being sober? Is that found in the text? What about faith? Is that found in the text? And love is found in the text. What else? Hope, comfort, and edification. We'll deal with all of those as time permits. All right, we'll come back to our questions here in a moment. Let's talk about the coming of, of the Lord. Two things are said here in this section. One is, it's unexpected and sudden. And secondly, God's children should be prepared for it because it is unexpected and sudden. Now, there are a couple of things that, that uh, uh, we ought to put as a background to uh, uh, what's said here is, one is the present day misunderstanding concerning the second coming and the other is perhaps their misunderstanding. We get into the second letter, uh, and whether they have been influenced by this at this juncture, I'm not sure. But in the second letter, there's an indication that some had forged a letter, someone perhaps had forged a letter and signed Paul's name on it, suggesting that the second coming of Christ was imminent, that it was about to take place, and it wasn't going to, bla it wasn't going to be a while off, but it's coming pretty soon. Well, that caused some misunderstanding, number one, and caused some sin because they thought it was about to immediately happen. They began to be lazy and da 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 da. The present day misunderstanding is premillennialism suggests that the signs of the coming of Christ are on the horizon that is coming soon, particularly if a war breaks out, and, I, and uh, particularly in the Middle East. Uh, the war in Europe doesn't, hasn't really developed uh, that kind of thought and driv or driven that kind of thought like when we have a conflict in the Middle East. If you have some conflict in the Middle East, particularly around Jerusalem at all, or involving Israel at all, suddenly the premillennialists begin, to, this is, these are the signs of the time. And he's about to return. He's going to return maybe within six months. And some even set a date. It's going to be on May 18th, 2025 or whatever. And, uh, okay, wow, that's, that's pretty specific. Uh, and yet what we're going to learn here is we don't know the days nor the seasons. So let's start verse 1 and 2. Let's, here's two things that he suggests, two illustrations he gives. And he says concerning the times and the seasons, the times and the seasons must be put in the context. The previous discussion in the previous chapter had to do with the second coming. He just talked about that, verses 13 to 18. So concerning those times and the seasons of the coming of the Lord, you have no need that I should write to you. In other words, well then why is he writing? Uh, may be the question. 
The reason that you have no need that I write to you, I think, is because no one knows the day nor the time. So there's not a need for me to tell you a concerning he's coming at a certain time, uh, that it's imminent, or that it's going to be a long way off, or I know the day nor the time. And secondly, that, that's one reason, because no one knows. So you don't have a need that I write to you and tell you it's unexpected, because you know it's unexpected. Hang on just a second. And then verse 4, uh, it gives a second reason for that. What would that second reason be? Because these people, from the report they've learned from Timothy, finish my sentence when you can, they already are living as they should in view of the second coming. <laughs> yeah. So they already are living that way. So let's go to verse 4. You're not in darkness so that the day should overtake you as a thief. You already are living like you should. It would be like me saying, I don't need to tell this crowd that uh, concerning the second coming. I don't need to tell this crowd that's about the second coming, about the times and the season, because everyone here already knows we don't know the day nor the time. We already know that. I doubt there's a person present who, who would be surprised to learn we don't know the day nor the time. And generally, there may be some exception, people are living like they should in view of the second coming. And so there's no need for me lecturing you about, we don't know the day nor the time, because you already know that, and you already are living like you should. Does that make sense? That's what he's saying here. Yes, sir, comment. Yeah, I was going to say that we are living in the last time. We are. The Acts 2 is the first reference where these are the last days. You're exactly right. We are in the last times. But how long is that last time going to last? No one knows the day nor the hour uh, of that. All right, for, exer for verse 2, let's get 2 and 3 to get the point he's making. For you yourselves know perfectly, in other words, you know well, you're well informed that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. What's the comparison to a thief coming? We don't know when he's coming. It's unexpected. Now, even if you thought a thief's going, to, by statistics, that a thief's going to break into your house or once a year, you don't know what day of the year that's going to be. You don't know what day that's going to happen. It's going to, when it happens, it's unexpected. Uh, when you think it probably the night's the night, it's probably not going to happen that night. But the, when you least expect it, it's when it's happened. If you've ever had a thief break into your house, and I have had uh, houses and offices and cars broke into, when you discover that, you were not expecting that. That wasn't what you were looking for. And that's the point. Now, at verse 3, the second illustration well, first he said, some will cry peace and safety. That seems to be the cry of those who are indifferent, uh, who say everything's fine, that there's nothing to worry about. Uh, we don't even need to worry about the second coming of the Lord. Peace and safety, suddenly destruction comes upon them as labor pains of a pregnant woman. What's the comparison to the labor pains? They often come... Well, unexpectedly, but suddenly, uh, seems to be the emphasis. Suddenly and unexpectedly. You may meet a woman who knows she's near that point, but uh, earlier in the day, and she doesn't have a clue she's about to go into labor, but before the day is, she's in labor pains. Came suddenly. So that's the point. Now, I want to get those two points and then go back and get the point at verse 3. That it's unexpected and it's sudden, so the coming of the Lord, because it's unexpected and sudden, Say again? Need to be prepared because we don't know the day nor the hour. Look, look at verse 3. I want to talk about this, um, this cry of the indifferent, that those who cry peace and safety, then suddenly destruction comes and they shall not escape. What does that tell you? No turning back, yes. No turning back. The, here's, here's the idea of those who have this, this indifferent attitude toward the second coming and being prepared uh, are facing destruction. So it comes unexpectedly and sudden. That's the main point. Let's go to 4 through 11. God's children should be prepared. And uh, so let's look at verses 4 and 5 together, and then we'll catch uh, verse 6. Verse 4 and 5, here's the key to our, to our text. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that the day should overtake you as a thief. In other words, we ought to be living as if we think he might be coming back today. Would that be a safe rule? I mean, he could come back today, so I don't want to live in view. 
If you knew he was returning today, would it make any difference in how you conduct yourself? Would it make any difference uh, whether you corrected something that you've been thinking about correcting? Would it make any difference about apologizing to someone that you've been meaning to apologize to? Uh, would you start maybe becoming a little more diligent when you've been thinking about being more diligent? It probably would. And so that, I think, is the point. So it should not overtake you. But you are sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. In other words, we're children of light and walking in, in the light. Um, any questions or comments thus, thus far before we get verse 6? In other words, verse 4, I think he's saying they had been warned, they are aware, and, and consequently they're walking in children of light. Now he shifts gears between verse 6 and 7 in his terminology. We'll, we'll, we'll try to uh, observe that as we go along. Verse 6, his point here is we should watch. We're not in darkness. In other words, you've been enlightened. You've been taught. Uh, you're not walking in error. You're not walking in sin. Uh, you're walking in the light. Now verse 6, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Now let's start with the word sober first, and then we'll come back. What does the word sober suggest to you? Yeah, it has a proper view of things. He's not under the influence. That's part of being sober. He has self-control. You might have a different translation that enlightens you a little bit. Generally, the word sober does have to do, in, in, in some contexts, free of intoxicants. But in other contexts where that contrast is not made, it has to do with taking life, basically, and this is a kind of a loose summary, but taking life seriously. In other words, a sober view of life. Um, we take life seriously. Now go back to verse 6 with that in, in mind. We are not, let us not sleep as others do. Now he's not talking about literal sleep. He's not saying don't rest. Uh, but he's talking about spiritual sleep. And so let us not sleep as others do. Those who are sleeping are not being watchful. And so if you were given the job of what, you need to watch that door right there. You need to watch because somebody will come through and want you to watch and you're laying there asleep. You're not watchful. So he's talking about this, this idea of being spiritually asleep and not watching. So let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and take life seriously. Uh, a footnote at verse 6 would say self-control, as I already pointed out. So here is this, that, that you, you have control of yourself and you're taking life seriously. Let us see your hand up. Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. They're they're not paying attention. They're not alert. Absolutely. Now, verse seven, I think, uses literal sleep here to illustrate his point. That's where I said he shifts gears. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. Uh, some commentators have had to, I'm not sure this is necessary, but uh, explain that that is not encouraging. Drinking is okay in the day, uh, or is not okay in the day, just eat what you need to do if you're gonna drink, drink at night. That's not the point, and that misses the whole context. The point is that this is what's generally true, and that is we, those who sleep, you sleep at night. And literally, you sleep at night. And those who get drunk generally don't get drunk in the daytime, though there are exceptions to that. Acts 2 is a, is a case in point. The Proverbs talks about that. They do that in, in, the, in the night, uh, perhaps uh, hiding their, their, uh, their sin or um, uh, for, for other reasons. Um, Yes. They're in, 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 in judging, but he's using a literal illustration to make the point he just drove at verse 6. Does that make sense? And, and so they're not attentive, they're not, not listening. His point here is we ought to be watchful in view of the second coming. God's children need to be prepared. Now verses 8 through 11 
is more the specifics of how we are prepared. And so here's how to be prepared. And so let's go, go through the list. First of all, verse 8, uh, let us who are of the day be sober. What does that suggest to you? Again, self-control would be part of that. Serious-minded, would that not be part of that? What else? The idea of being, uh, uh, in other words, th those of the day are taking advantage of the light. That's the point. We take advantage of the light that has been shined upon us. Uh, and so we ought to be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and of love. And so uh, put on faith, put on love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, I want you to notice verses 8 through 10 talks about hope. So what, what, first of all, what does he mean by putting on the hope, a uh, helmet of hope? And then we'll see what the context says. Faith has a lot to do with it. All right, faith has a lot to do with it. That's true. What does a helmet do? It gives protection. Um, and if, if we put on hope and understand what hope is and what it involves, it serves as our protection, doesn't it? All right, let's get verse uh, 9 and 10 with that. Uh, four, here's the reason he says that. God has not appointed us to wrath. Now, point, the point here is not, God has not appointed us to be people of anger. So that's not what he's talking about. He's, what, what wrath is he talking about? Judgment, exactly. The wrath of God. But in contrast, to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, God didn't create us so that we would be punished in judgment that we might be but that's not why he created us but that he might save us through Christ who died for us that whether we wake or sleep we should live together with him so what God's intent was that whether we're we're awake still living on earth or we're asleep dead physically that we might be in a relationship with Christ uh, now notice it verse uh, that we should live at verse 10 together with him I think that refers to eternity that's that hope and that serves as a protection. So part of getting prepared is to be sober, put on faith, put on love. Verse 11. What's that say? Yeah, encourage or comfort one another. Uh, same word for encourage or comfort, same word. And edify one another. So comfort one another and edify one another. And then notice the last phrase. Just, what does that tell you? Say again. Keep up the good work. It tells me they've al they're already doing what they ought to be doing. Verse 4 had made that point. And now verse 11 makes that point again. And that's one of the reasons I have no need that I write to you. Because you're doing what you need to be doing. I'm just trying to encourage you. Now, let's go back to verse 11 before we start a new section. How can they comfort each other and edify one another? Suppose you had a friend... Uh, visiting with you who knows nothing much about the Bible and they say okay I got this exhortation we're supposed to comfort one another and edify one another how you do that what would you say on the way home they ask you that what's your answer to that question how do you comfort one another how do you edify one another what are you going to tell them All right, example is one way. What else? Do what? Yeah, you conduct your example. Okay. Pray for each other and let them know we're praying. Absolutely. When, when you see other people doing that very thing. It's also interesting that he, what has he just said in chapter 4 and verse 18? Comfort with words. What words? With the gospel. These words. That is the, the revelation that's just been given. 
He just gave the revelation and you comfort one another with these words. And so we can comfort one another with the word of God. We can exhort and encourage one another with the word of God. All right, let's move on now. Uh, let's talk about various duties now and let's get a question or two out of the way. Uh, there are three different relationships, but let's get a couple of questions out of the way. Let's get number uh, question number six. What is the duty to, uh, of elders as revealed in this context? All right, they have labor, they have work to see to. What else? All right. What else? All right. Over. They have some oversight. Anything else? All right, they teach and instruct. Very good. All those are good. Let's talk about the elders. He talks about, uh, let's get ahead of herself. Uh, and I want you to see that he deals with duties to elders, to all the brethren, and then duties to God. So let's back up and deal with duties to elders in verses 12 to 13. He doesn't mention the term elder, but those who are over you in the Lord, and the only reference to that in any other passage in the New Testament, to my knowledge, has reference to elders who have oversight. Acts 20, verse 28, 1 Peter 5, 1 and 2, Hebrews 13. Um, so let's go back to verse 12 now. Brethren, uh, he said, I urge you to recognize those who labor among you. The English standard would say respect. New American standard said appreciate. Um, in other words, pay attention to and have some respect. Why would, would you need to respect? We ought to respect everybody, but why would he say respect elders? All right, wisdom. Yeah, they're watching for your, for your soul. Knowledge. Knowledge. I, I'm looking, I'm fishing for something here. Not that these are wrong answers. I'm fishing. For the office that they hold. That they hold. Think of the same principle of uh, respecting uh, the king or leaders. You might not have any respect for the person. Now, this wouldn't, shouldn't be true of an elder, but... Uh, in, in the office of, say, president, you may not respect the person, but you ought to respect the person who holds the office because of the office. The same thing may be true. There may be some things you don't like about the person that holds that office of elder, but if he's qualified, I should respect him for the office he holds. Make sense? All right. So recognize those who labor among you, so they labor among you, and are over you in the Lord, and they admonish you. In other words, they teach, they instruct. Uh, they may not always be doing the actual teaching, but everything in the classrooms, everything in the pulpit, finish my sentence, they're responsible. they're responsible for. So John Doe may be in the pulpit in a gospel meeting. The elders are behind that, and if they're not supportive of what they say, that's their job to deal with that. Falls on the elder's shoulder. Would you agree? They're to correct that, get that changed. So recognize them, esteem them, and then verse 13, we haven't got to, and esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And then he said, be at peace among yourselves. I think peace among yourselves probably goes with the next thought, though several commentators make an interesting point that being peace among yourselves, that is being peaceful, is one of the ways to show respect for elders. It makes their work a whole lot easier as when we're at peace with one another. Whether that's the connection or not, I'm not sure. All right, let's move on from that. And that's duties toward elders. Let's talk about our duties to, to all the brethren and others beginning at verse 13. And one of those is to be at peace. Uh, it's an atmosphere of, of harmony. Uh, let me get my place here. I've done lost my verse here. Yeah, verse 13. Be at peace among yourselves. Romans 12, 18 would have uh, a connection there. If it is possible, live peaceably with all men. Um, any comments on that peace among yourselves? Let's go to verse 14. I want you to notice, if you don't get anything else, three categories of people, perhaps you have this marked, that uh, we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly. If you don't have a marginal note, that word unruly 
is the same word that is translated disorderly in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, withdraw from the disorderly. It means to walk out of step, walk out of rank. And so here is one who is walking contrary um, to, to the will of God. The same person you would withdraw from in 2 Thessalonians 3 and in verse 6. Warn those who are unruly. In other words, they need to be warned that if something is not done, there's, there's, there may be discipline. You're going to lose your soul. Comfort the faint-hearted. Who would be the faint-hearted? You may have a translation that uses another term. Discouraged. Those who are easily discouraged uh, and uh, they, they have, they're lacking the courage to meet some of the challenges they have. Uh, and then thirdly, uphold the weak. That is, uh, it may be they're, they're, they're weak in body or weak in spirit, but it probably has to do with their weakness of their faith. What I want you to see is there's three categories of people mentioned here. Uh, point two, three, and four. The unruly, the faint-hearted, and the weak are not the same people. So here's a babe in Christ who is lacking, and they don't have a good understanding of the Scriptures, and they may do some things contrary to the will of God that they just need some instruction and encouragement. We're not ready to withdraw from them. We just need to, 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 to uphold the weak, try to strengthen them. Someone is discouraged. They're not unruly. They just need comfort. They need some encouragement. The unruly need stern warnings. So the weak may not need that sharp rebuke, but the unruly may need that sharp rebuke. The unruly don't need to be comforted. They need to be warned. You see the difference? And so someone says, well, this brother has, has committed a sin. We need to withdraw from him. Wait a minute. It might be he's weak. He might be discouraged. He may not be the unruly who has been warned and warned and warned and still pressing on in the sin. If we get that distinction, that helps us when we get to 2 Thessalonians 3. They're not all in the same category. Make sense? Don't give up on them. We're not even giving up when we withdraw from them. We're continuing to admonish them. But the point is that there's a distinction in the unruly and the faint-hearted and the weak. This person may be weak, this one may be discouraged, and this one may be just unruly. And we're going to have to deal with that one more sternly than you do this one over here. So it gives different instructions to the different categories. Then he says, be patient to all, uh, long-suffering. Uh, same word that's found in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, that it suffers long. Same word translated suffers long is the same word for patient. I mean, bear with one another. There are things we'll have to tolerate uh, and have patience in that sense. Uh, verse 15, do not render evil for evil, uh, but we're always pursuing what's good. Then he says, uh, rejoice always. Rejoice always. By the way, for th this is no edification here. This is just a bit of trivia. We often talk about Jesus wept being the shortest verse of the Bible. In the original, this is the shortest verse in the Bible. Now, I don't know what you're going to do with that information, but <laughs> you might want a trivia game on that uh, somewhere. But anyway, rejoice always. Harmonizes with Philippians 3, uh, 1, 4, 1, 4, 11, those passages. Uh, so here's our, re you, you think about being in harmony, uh, warning the unruly, comforting the faint-hearted, upholding the weak, etc. Uh, that's our responsibility toward all uh, men. Let's get the, the next section. Our responsibility toward God is what? 17 and 18. Pray without ceasing. What does that mean? It, it's, it's a regular theme. Praying without ceasing is like eating without ceasing. You don't eat 24 hours a day, but you don't ever give up on eating. You re eat at regular times, and the same thing, you have regular times of prayer. And that should include thanks, uh, verse 18. Now let's get 19 and 20. This has to do with our relationship to God. It says, let me summarize that, and then I'll come back and tell you what I think the context is really talking about. I think the point is, don't resist God. Don't resist the Word of God. Don't resist the revelation of God is the point he's trying to make. And so don't quench the Spirit. The Spirit reveals the Word. And don't despise prophecies and put all things to the test and hold to that which is good. I think that's in the context of spiritual gifts because we don't have prophecy today. We have the result of prophecy. And uh, so I think it's in the context of, of spiritual gifts in other words, don't quench and resist the Spirit's revelation. Don't despise or belittle prophecy, someone who prophesies. 
And in the days of spiritual gifts, there would be the discerning of spirits. So put the spirits to the test to find out what's true and what's false and then hold to what's good. Now, does that have any practical application to us, even though we don't live in spiritual gifts times? How? Yeah. I, I don't have, we don't have the gift of prophecy, but I have the, the completed prophecy. And I have the revelation of the Spirit, and so I'm not to quench this, I'm not to despise this. And when I hear something that sounds contrary, I need to put it to the test and reject that which is wrong and hold to that which is good. So my relationship to God is to, to not resist God. And then let's look at verse 22. This was an abused verse for many years uh, because of the King James rendering of that. The New King James says, abstain from every form of evil. Um, that is um, the correct rendering of that. So is the, New, uh, or the King James, the correct rendering of that, by the way. Um, it's just an archaic use of the term. Uh, the point is, abstain from any e evil in any form. If it's in the form of the lust of the flesh, ab abstain from it. Lust of the eyes, abstain from it. Pride of life, abstain from it. E evil in any form, run away from it. But the abuse has been made, the appearance of evil. I've heard many times people talk about, uh, this looks bad, so you ought, to, you ought not do it because you're to abstain from the very appearance of evil. It appears to be wrong. Maybe a good point. There are better verses to use. I'd use Psalm 1. I'd use, I would use uh, Psalm 106. I would use some other passages. Don't take this one out of context. It is not talking about if it looks like it's wrong, it, it's wrong. That's not the point. Argue that from another text. Wrong verse. Find you a better one. But not this one. This is not talking about, check all your translations. Check, check what the, by, by the way, the word very it is not in the original. Uh, the very appearance of evil. It's talking about uh, evil no matter how it appears. Stay away from it. That's the point of the text. Not that if it looks bad, if you're uh, drinking uh, uh, apple juice at the restaurant and it looks like wine, you shouldn't have drank the apple juice because it looks like and it appears to be evil. Um, wrong verse, wrong verse. Get you a better one. Uh, to make that point. Now let's close with looking at the salutations here. What do we learn from the salutations? Verse 23 and 24. Paul's prayer for them is what? Their whole spirit, soul, and body. I think that's the whole being of man, his uh, immortal soul, his immortal spirit, his soul, the life within the body, soul and spirit are used interchangeably at times, but there are times they are distinct, different. Here they are. And his body. But what he wants is that they be preserved blameless at the second coming. Here's his goal. Does that make sense? That's my goal. I want you to be blameless at the some, uh, second coming. Then he adds another point. What is it? I want you to Pray for us, verse 25. That is the Thessalonians. It, it would be an encouragement to Paul and a need for them to pray for Paul and for his work. And then what does he say? Verse 26. Yeah. The idea of a holy kiss is, is that which is, uh, it was a form of greeting. It's holy in the sense that it's pure. It's not licentious kind of, it's not that kind of kiss, but you greet with like a warm handshake uh, in our day and time, a, a way of cordial greeting. Uh, and so greet one another, greet the brethren that are there. And then verse 27, here's what I want you to do with this epistle. Read it to all. That might have a reference to the public reading of the scriptures, you think? If not, at least everyone there ought to have read the scriptures read this epistle. Make sure that everyone there in this church gets to hear this epistle. Um, and so not being able to make quick copies of that, it would seem to be a public reading of, the, of, of the, uh, the epistle. And then he closes with, grace of the Lord be with you all. And that's how he ends the letter. And then a little bit later now, he's going to start a second letter. And that's where we'll start next time.